morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Today we will have CBRS and Cambio Networks, everything you need to know with Matt Mangriotis, Director of Product Management. We will get started in just about a minute uh, to make sure that everyone can join us today. And thank you for being with us. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Matt Mangriotis. I'm the uh, Director of Product Management for the 450 product line, as well as CN Ranger. And uh, today we're going to talk about CBRS. It's a topic that's uh, been heating up lately and something that uh, most folks, any folks who are going to be playing in the 3 gig band, uh, should be aware of. Whether you choose to participate or not, you should be aware of what's going on and uh, how things are going to work here. I think it's a good idea to kind of um, be aware and perhaps uh, start trialing, uh, if you're, especially if you're planning on using Cambium equipment in that band. So without further ado, let's uh, get moving. Let's see here. Um, I want to start by talking about the PMP450 product line in this band. Um, hopefully everyone on the call is at least familiar with 450 and uh, what it does. It's our flagship four, um, point to multi-point product line that is really great at a lot of different things um, and especially with the introduction of CN Medusa in this product line. CN Medusa is our multi-user MIMO capable product that provides maximum capacity uh, about three times the capacity of a, a standard 450i sector. Uh, it does 8x8 multi-user MIMO. Uh, what that means is that it can talk to up to four subscribers at any given time slot. Um, we can support up to a 40 meg channel leading to huge capacities, uh, really big capacity, um, unmatched spectral efficiency in the band, uh, doing things that, that LTE can't do, um, yet being able to take an existing platform and migrate, um, and we'll talk about how we're going to do that migration to CBRS uh, using this particular technology. Um, again, protecting your investment. So we, we talk about CN Medusa as having really great spectral efficiency, really great capacity. You can deploy it today under your existing Part 90 license um, and then you can migrate it seamlessly, if you will, um, to the Part 96 rules, the CBRS rules, uh, when those come around. Um, so hopefully everyone's familiar with that. If not, then uh, I just gave a quick snapshot and you can, can read more about it. Um, there's a white paper online in our website that uh, talks about the technology that's uh, used to achieve this great capacity, spectral efficiency, the ability to do better um, sensitivity, and especially in the uplink. Uh, we also support now uplink multi-user MIMO, which is a really great feature if you're doing a kind of a video surveillance use case. I know that's not as common in the 3 gig band. However, it's an option, uh, whether you're using 5 or 3, uh, to do heavy in the uplink. Uh, which is something, again, that LTE falls way short on. I'm going to flash the roadmap up here. I'm not going to go through it all, uh, but I do want to point out a couple of things. Um, 
first and foremost, uh, we are planning to support CBRS with this product line. Uh, it's in the roadmap for Q3. The September timeframe is what we're being told is the commercial release uh, for the SAS and for the uh, CBRS rules to take effect. That's not set in stone. Uh, we keep our heads and ears uh, very closely monitoring what's going on. We participate in the WIND Forum, who's the, the industry body that's designing the rules. Uh, we also uh, participate in CBRS Alliance, uh, so we're aware of what that group is, is working toward as well. Uh, they're mainly focused on LTE, but uh, we are definitely the other technology that's in play uh, at this point in time. Uh, the other big thing on this roadmap that I want to point out is the 3 gig 450B. Uh, we have the existing 450 SMs that are out there that will continue to be support um, Part 90 as well as being able to migrate to Part 96 to CBRS. Uh, but we are introducing a 450B under Part 96. Uh, the high gain version is coming out first and that will be the next generation of SM to support the 3 gig 450 product line. So we're getting the high gain out in Q3, and then in early 2020 we have the mid gain coming. Um, and I'm showing those uh, here. The, S, the mid gain will actually look a little bit different. We're going to have a 2x2 two two array, a patch panel array, so it's going to be more square than horizontal uh, as shown in the picture. That's the 5 gig that's shown there, but we're going to adjust the design to uh, have a little bit better antenna pattern on the 3 gig. And the high gain will look very similar in terms of a dish, an integrated dish, to get the, the high gain um, for you on that. Otherwise, very, very similar to the 450B in 5 gig. So let's talk about CBRS a little bit. I gave you a little bit of background on the uh, product line, which I, I assume most of the folks on the call are already familiar with. Uh, but let's talk about CBRS itself. So what does it do? It basically brings new spectrum to the 3 gig band, um, but under some very specific coordination or rules uh, that allow that are supposed to allow use more use, more broad use of the spectrum while minimizing interference. It raises the EIR, EIRP levels, the power levels that you're available to, to use. Uh, in, currently in their part 90, you can get to 43 dBm on, in a 20 megahertz channel. Uh, it's lower as you get smaller because there's a power spectral density effect. Um, but under part 96, you can go up to, all the way up to 47 dBm. Um, the Medusa radio can take advantage of that fully. Uh, it does leverage this, this central database, this spectrum access system, a SAS. Uh, and that coordinates the spectrum usage. So you actually have to talk to a database. The equipment talks to a database automatically all the time um, to allow specific frequencies to be used. That's the tricky part, and that's the part we're going to probably spend the most time on. Um, we're making it easy to transition from Part 90 to Part 96. There are several different manufacturers out there with 3 gig radios. Uh, I don't know their, all their plans on how they're going to do this. I know some of them are not going to do this. Uh, it behooves you if you're using somebody else's equipment to go figure out what their plans are in terms of transition, how it's going to be done, uh, if it's going to be done, uh, because that's a very tricky situation. We've, we've actually spent a lot of time developing tools that will ease this migration or, or help us with this transition because it's, uh, it's not easy uh, and it's a little bit complex in terms of how it's got to be done. Um, so we're working towards that, and we're going to have an easy transition for our equipment uh, to make sure that it's uh, seamless and easy to do. And then there are costs. There are costs associated with using the 3 gig band, and that's, that has to do with this communication to the SAS. The SAS is actually a network of sensors. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, um, there's, there is a network of sensors that the SAS coordinates with to allow uh, frequency use in areas where previously were just completely exclu excluded, mostly on the coastal areas, um, but anywhere there's naval radar uh, that could, could potentially encroach. They're called exclusion zones today under Part 90, but tomorrow with the sensor network in place, the SAS can allow uh, 3 gig to function on those coastal areas. Uh, but all of that stuff costs money to operate and maintain, and so there's a, there is a cost that Cambium will be charging our customers uh, and passing through to the SAS. Um, but when you compare it against the gains you get with the additional spectrum, additional power, um, we think the cost is, is absorbable. It's maybe not uh, easy to absorb, but it's, it's absorbable. 
You probably have seen a graph like this before or a slide like this before, but what this talks about is really the opportunity in this band. So today, currently, there's 50 megahertz of spectrum between 365 and 370. Uh, typically in a licensed band, you're paying for a lot for a lot less spectrum, and you have to make maximal use of that spectrum. Uh, what CBRS is doing is bringing another 100 megahertz to the table, uh, but it's being done so in a tiered use structure. Uh, and that means there is different levels of, of users. The incumbents uh, are the government. Uh, they're the guys that have the um, overarching say whether they get to use it or not. If they are not using the spectrum, then it falls to the priority license holders, of which there are none yet. Uh, auctions will occur likely late in 2020. Um, there's no plans to do that uh, anytime in 2019. They said the earliest they believe can, this can be done, and this is from the FCC, uh, is sometime in Q2 of 2020, but I, I suspect it'll slip out even a little bit further. Uh, so I would think late 2020 uh, licenses will start to be auctioned off. The licenses are countywide, um, and therefore 10 megahertz chunks of spectrum. We'll talk in a little more detail in the next slide about where those where those licenses will be. And then if incumbents or priority license holders are not using the spectrum, then the rest of the spectrum that's available is open to general authorized access. And it becomes at least 80 megahertz, but up to all of it, up to 150 megahertz of spectrum available for GAA. What this means in the US is that we have established a new TD LTE band that's recognized by 3GPP, it's band 48, and that covers that 355 to 37. Elsewhere in the world, there's still the WiMAX type bands, uh, band 42 and 43, that have moved to, to LTE, that, uh, the 3.4 to 3.6 3 and 3.6 to 3.8. But in the US, the, the band of concern now is band 48. So a little bit uh, more detailed breakdown. This is from Google, um, but it applies across the board. Uh, the incumbents, again, can use whatever they want throughout the entire spectrum, and they're the priority. Uh, and that includes the radar, especially in coastal areas, as well as the fixed satellite stations, uh, Earth stations. There are, the next orange one in 3650 to 3700 is the incumbents that had registered their sites prior to April of 2016 and registered for grandfather protection. Now, if you were operating an NN license or a, a 365 license, under Part 90, and you had equipment out there, and you registered that equipment prior to April of 2016, this is going back a ways already, um, then you were offered a grandfather protection zone around your access points, around your sectors. And that provides you incumbent status in that spectrum from 3650 to 3700 in those locations. And so th you'll enjoy that incumbent status and have priority over both the PALs and the GAA uh, until that expires, and that's registered, and uh, it's scheduled to expire when the, the Part 90 stuff expires in 2020 at this point in time. PALs will uh, be only in the lower 100 and up to seven in any given area. So uh, PALs will be auctioned off up to seven 10 megahertz chunks in any given location, any given county, um, and that means that three, 30 of those megahertz will remain free. And it's very likely, it's not written in the rules this way, but it's very likely that the seven 10 megahertz channels will be at the lower end of the spectrum, leaving those 30 megahertz from 3620 to 3650 open uh, for GAA. That's very likely going to happen. I don't think it will always happen because there may be some cases where a uh, PAL winner wants a specific spectrum. I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, it's not clear how that's going to be allocated yet. Uh, but clearly, if a auction uh, a bidder wins more than one channel, they will get contiguous channels. Uh, that, that will surely be um, the case. Um, but there are some cases where there may be a PAL section and then a non-PAL GAA section that you want to use, in which case carrier aggregation might be a great feature to have. So that's the, a little bit more detail in the spectrum. The next couple of slides really talk about the terminology. I'm not going to go through all these um, ad nauseum, uh, but the slides will be made available and posted on the community so you can kind of look at, at the definitions of each of these acronyms. 
coming with CBRS, uh, starting with CBRS, I guess. So there's a there's a ton of acronyms to know. Um, a lot. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's it's good to get familiar so you know what uh, what folks are talking about. Yet another language to learn. Um, 450. The architecture is very simple. I wanted to kind of point out how how this is going to work currently, or how how it works currently, and then how it's going to work under the CBRS uh, scheme. So today. Uh, simple architecture. You have an AP sector. Uh, you put a configuration on there. You have a switch that goes to your backhaul. I mean, that goes to your core rather, and then the, the, through the to the internet. Um, your SMs are configured. You can set uh, all the provisioning and all that. You can do that any number of ways with our 450 equipment. You can do it with zero touch. Uh, you can do it automatically with uh, CN Archer using Radius to authenticate. However, you want to do it. There's a number of ways to do it, but the point is, it's fully controlled by the local configuration, um, and you can you have full control over that. Under the CBRS rules, uh, things become a little bit different, and because of the requirements there, um, you have to make requests uh, of the spectrum, and you're requesting that spectrum, and it either gets approved, uh, adjusted, or rejected by the SAS, and the SAS really is controlling the parameters of the radio operation. Uh, so if things change for some reason, if something should change, um, then the it, it the SAS can actually send down commands to make the radios do something different. Basically, um, you don't have control any longer of necessarily the power level um, or the frequency that it's operating on. Um, so be aware of that. The AP is the device that's actually making that communication. So the being Pay attention to the red arrows on this uh, slide. So the AP is the one making the communication. The SMs tell the AP what they're doing and where they are. The AP collects all that information and then sends it back up. It goes through CN Maestro and what we're calling our domain proxy. Uh, the domain proxy is what actually is communicating directly to the SAS. Uh, it has certification, digital certification, as well as doing this on a secure um, channel, uh, secure port. It's that connection must be maintained throughout operation, and that, that has to continue um, throughout transmission. So if, if the radio is transmitting, uh, it loses connection to the SAS for some reason, after five minutes, it will stop transmitting. It, it needs to be in constant communication. We'll talk about the messages that go back and forth in just a minute as well. So it gets a bit complicated. It gets a little bit more out of your direct control in 3 gig. So the frequency scheme is fairly simple. Uh, it looks a little com complicated here. Uh, for re future purposes, uh, most of the SASs, or at least the, the SASs we're working with, have broken the spectrum into five megahertz chunks, uh, and they've numbered them uh, in five megahertz chunks. The WIN forum has defined the band as 15, 10 megahertz chunks, and these are going to be allocated as necessary based on the requests that they get. So if you request, let's say, a 20 megahertz channel, and your center channel is 3670, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner there, it's uh, it's going to allocate two channels if they're available, and say, no problem, you have two 10 megahertz channels together, and you can operate as a 20 megahertz channel and move on with life. Um, you can no longer request something that's not on the channel or uh, with the center channel in the middle, such as the bottom right-hand corner. If I request something with the center channel of 3667, the SAS will not will not do that because um, it wants to allocate the channels appropriately to maximize use of the spectrum. So everyone is using the same uh, center channels, basically. Uh, I failed to mention, but if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the question box, and uh, we can get to them as necessary. And hopefully, uh, if you do, uh, if if I have any, I can stop the presentation and answer those if if necessary. So feel free to type questions in the question box, and I'll see them. Um, getting back to the frame, or what happens during the the communication between the radios and the SAS, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you're going to go ahead and ask for uh, a grant, and so you send that that grant request. It says, okay, yes or no. Um, if it's a request that it can grant, then it grants, and then the CBSD, the device itself, has a an, an authorized grant, and then he starts sending these heartbeat messages. It happens once every 150 seconds. Um, it says the typical time of exchange is about two and a half minutes. 
um, if it misses one, if for some reason the acknowledgement doesn't come back to the radio, uh, it will accelerate the process. It, it goes a little faster uh, because it, what it doesn't want to do is lose the five minute window uh, that will require the radio to stop transmitting. Um, so it'll continue to send these heartbeat messages, receive acknowledgements, and then therefore go on with uh, transmissions. Again, if it misses a couple of heartbeats in a row uh, and it cannot get uh, acknowledgement that those heartbeats are being received, uh, then it will stop transmitting after five minutes. So uh, not everything is done. I, I, I do want to point out, I know we said at the beginning that we called this one uh, everything you need to know about CBRS. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have all the answers just yet. Um, there's still some things being determined. A lot of it has to do with the coexistence, uh, what happens when the spectrum is full, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of it has to do also with how you've arranged or operate your network today, and are you going to do it a little bit differently tomorrow? So in terms of our equipment, we have color codes uh, that help you determine which APs your SMs will connect to, which, uh, which ones you want them to connect to. We also have the concept of secondary color codes to help load balance. Uh, those guys across sectors and so we're not really sure yet how that's going to play into the the SAS and how they can manage uh, secondary color codes or the usage of intersector group IDs um, so we got some work to do there uh, we're working very closely with the SASs on, on developing processes and use cases that make sense uh, we'll be developing features in Maestro to help with this uh, as we go forward in time we are introducing new modules uh, to handle the billing piece of it. Um, when you have a certain number of subscribers on and you want to bill, uh, we will definitely be um, incorporating that into Maestro uh, as well as some other tools. Um, provisioning. Uh, provisioning might be a little different depending on which SAS we have um, in incorporated in there and how that exactly is going to look. We're not sure about that yet. Uh, I do want to spend a minute about uh, ICD. So there's a concept uh, coming up called ICD. That's initial commercial deployment. That's the first time that the radio, the SAS, will be in operation commercially uh, in the U.S. The expectation right now is that that'll happen mid-July. So coming right up uh, in about a month, um, less than a month. That's we are participating in ICD with a, a couple different uh, SAS vendors. Uh, there's also a concept of STA, which is a special temporary authority to operate in the lower uh, 100 megahertz of spectrum. That is more of what I would consider a beta, uh, beta testing of this. Now, if, if you are a customer uh, that is interested in operating in either ICD or, or via beta uh, just to try out the SAS, I would encourage you to contact myself um, and we can arrange to get you up and going uh, using your, your Part 90 equipment, your 450 equipment, um, but trying it out under the CBRS rules and seeing what it looks like. Um, that's a good idea to get familiar, get your, your uh, company familiar with what's going to, what it's going to look like under the new scheme. Um, so again, I'll, I'll give you some contact information at the end of the presentation if you want to do that as well. So we are working very hard to ensure the readiness of the platform. We already have uh, a grant uh, for Part 96 for the 450 Medusa. It's already in place. It's uh, publicly available. You can go search for it on the FCC website. Um, we expect the grant for the remainder of the equipment, the 450i and the 450SM, um, within about a week, maybe two. Uh, there's a couple of questions that they had about them that we're cleaning up now, but there are at the very end of the process and we expect them to be granted any day now. Um, we are working with Federated, Google, and Comscope as SaaS providers. Uh, there are only about five total SaaS providers. These are the three that would be kind of in your space uh, if you're a service provider. Um, and that's really about, uh, we're going to be working with, with probably Federated and Google most likely. Um, we will choose one as our primary and partner with them. and. At the end of the day, we hope that it really doesn't matter um, between those two who, who you prefer or who you want to be um, your SAS as the function hopefully will be very similar. Now, all of them are offering added services on top of just being the SAS, and so there may be a, a opportunity for you to use a tool 
um, that's not part of the actual SAS um, from one of these vendors, like such as a planning tool or something like that. Um, but we're going to partner and try and make it as transparent as possible, try and make it as seamless and easy to use as possible. So hopefully at one point down the road, you won't even need to uh, know who you're using as the SAS. Again, we will be billing through us, um, through Cambium, on a monthly basis um, for every device. And it's necessary to be using CN Maestro. Um, the 450B, again, I mentioned the high gain will be out in Q3. And our goal is to make it as seamless as possible to transition from Part 90 to Part 96. Now, when the CBRS band goes into effect in September, uh, we don't, you don't need to make that transition until April of 2020 as it stands right now. There is a petition from WISPA, the Wireless Internet Service Provider Association, to extend or waive that deadline, um, but there hasn't been a ruling on that yet, so we don't know yet uh, what that means. Um, that waiver would mean that uh, you don't need to transition on that date, that the, the Part 90 expiration uh, may be waived um, and you may continue to operate under Part 90 for a longer period of time. Again, the request was for that to happen until April 20, or, sorry, January 2023. Um, there's been no ruling from the FCC, although they have said that they are looking at it and so hopefully um, for customers that don't want to make this transition, they can continue to operate for a longer period of time. That's the that's the goal of that uh, waiver petition. All right. Um, there's another white paper online um, that talks about the differences between the 450 platform and LTE. Um, the 450 platform we know is um, better capacity, better spectral efficiency. Uh, it's easier to use. There's less complexity associated with it. It's a flatter network. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to using 450 in this space. Um, there is an advantage to using LTE, and that is really about range and coverage. Uh, LTE brings along with it a lot of research and development among getting the you know, OFDMA in there. There's all kinds of uh, really cool things that it does to, to maintain that link and connection. So it does near and online a site a little bit better than 450, and that's really where uh, LTE shines. Um, but if you need capacity, and you need the uh, the ability to have a flexible frame, and you need the spectral efficiency to take best advantage of the spectrum you have available, uh, 450 is hands down uh, a, a better product for you. Um, and if you want to continue to use 450 without having to forklift everything, I mean, this, this is where we're headed with CBRS and making sure that we're able to make that transition. So at the end of the day, I have a couple of steps that I would recommend to anybody who's interested in uh, maintaining their 450 network through this transition. Familiarize yourself with what's going on. Uh, don't put your head in the sand. Don't ignore it until the last minute. Make sure you understand what's expected uh, and what, what's coming. Um, again, as far as timing goes, the expectation right now is that in mid-July, this ICD will start, and it'll last probably 45 to 60 days. Um, there will be a period of time where the FCC is reviewing everything and figuring out when um, things will go into effect. And then the expectation right now is the commercial implementation or turning it loose, so to speak, will happen in September. That's kind of what we're hearing from everyone uh, at this point in time. So if you're migrating with the existing equipment, again, if you're using Cambium, I've, I've kind of shared our plans. Uh, we will have the ability to do this migration in a great way. Um, we don't know what others are planning to do, uh, and, and we know for, for a fact that some others are not planning to make this migration. So again, if that w petition for a waiver to operate in Part 90 is not extended, uh, you will be required to cease operation of Part 90 on April of 2020, which is less than a year away. So just uh, be aware of that. CPI, I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but one of the requirements of of CBRS is that it's put in place by a certified professional installer or a CPI. Um, you will be required to have a CPI put in the equipment and even to make the transition from existing Part 90 to Part 96 there will be involvement from a CPI. So it's highly recommended that you get started on that sooner rather than later. Um, September is going to be here before you know it and it's, it probably behooves you to understand what's required of a CPI before September. Um, 
several of those SASs, uh, all of the SASs have a CPI training course that's been accredited already and approved by the WIND Forum. Um, we've taken many of them uh, already and, and are good with all of them. We will have our own module uh, for Cambium equipment that can be tacked on to that CPI training. It's not in order to get the certification, but in order to familiarize yourself with how CPI is uh, applies to Cambium equipment. Uh, so we'll have that training available well before September. Um, there's a webinar available publicly that Richard Bernhardt put on. It, it talks about all the things you need to know around CPI. It's not the CPI training itself, but it's kind of what, what the uh, aspects of it leading up to the training. So it's a good thing to do right away. CPI training does cost a bit of money. I think it's uh, six or seven hundred dollars depending on who you get it from. Um, but it's a, it, I highly encourage you to go check it out and uh, uh, take that training if you know you're going to need a CPI uh, to do this transition. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. I know it was a lot in a, in a short period of time. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for Q&A. I see there are some questions in here, so I'll start uh, I'll start answering them as I can. Um, let's see. So uh, there's a number of associations and groups. Uh, yes, Wind Forum and CBRS Alliance. Cambium is a part of is members of both of those groups. Um, we're members of Wind Forum. We participate in the working groups, uh, depending on which working group is. Um, kind of has any contentious rules in place or needs any discussion, we do participate. We have uh, someone that sits in on those meetings. Um, I am also the, the representative for the CBRS Alliance uh, within Cambium. Um, so I attend those meetings as well and uh, stay very in tune with what's going on there. Uh, just a note on that. So CBRS Alliance I mentioned was really focused on LTE technology uh, and not proprietary technology. Uh, but we, we believe we have the largest install base of any technology in the 365 band. So there's going to be a need to support non-LTE technology using CBRS. And so we, we know we're going to do that. And we, we are the only other technology accredited or in the rules, written into the rules uh, with the WIND forum, aside from LTE. So it's just something to, to note as well. So the only other proprietary technology written into the rules. Um, Will the fees be monthly or annual? Uh, the fees, as it stands right now, we believe we'll, we will be charging monthly. It's a monthly recurring fee for the number of devices you have connected to the SAS. Um, and that'll be done not through channel partners, but directly with Cambium. We haven't uh, shared what those fees are going to be yet. Um, as a point of reference, Google has shared that they will be charging $2.25 per link uh, or per device and that'll be a monthly recurring fee. Ours will be somewhere a little bit more than that. Uh, what Google, if you go direct to Google, uh, you, you need also to have digital certificates put into the radios. Every radio needs its own digital certificate so those have an added cost as well as with us we have the, the domain proxy that's being used uh, so there's some added costs and overhead that we have to account for there and we will be covering the the cost of those digital certificates as well um, so it will be slightly north of 225 uh, but we have not released pricing yet on that um, but assume somewhere on the order of a few dollars per per device um, let's see there's a few wisps that are licensing or leasing other people's 365 um, that's actually perfectly okay to do. I don't think there's an issue with that, uh, but they will expire. All If you look at the, the FCC database on 365 today, I think about 90% of all licenses expire on April of 2020. So I think there's no, there's not going to be any enforcement, um, I don't believe. And again, this is I'm not a lawyer. I'm not uh, the FCC, so don't take what I'm saying as gospel. However, I don't believe there will be any enforcement under Part 90 until we get to part 96 and then I think that you will see some crackdown to make sure that the new spectrum is being used per the rules so I think that that's what's going to happen there uh, let's see have the SAS providers described their architecture for redundancy to ensure there is mitigated risk of loss of heartbeat um, yeah the SAS providers all have uh, redundancy built into their server systems um, they all have a very high availability as a uh, 
you know, they tout that as a selling point. So they, and it's their business, it's their lifeblood. Um, maybe not Google is, is critical for them, but the uh, certainly Federated Wireless, this SaaS is their only business. Um, so they're going to ensure that it, it's up and running at any given point in time. Um, it, just like with our system, with our domain proxy and CN Maestro, we have a high availability server system built in with redundancy to ensure that our por portion of that communication path is not down either uh, anytime. Uh, this deck will be available publicly so you guys can share it with whoever you'd like. Um, it'll be posted in our forum and uh, communicated after the after the webinar. Uh, the question is if the backhaul is down, how do you know that they're not transmitting? Uh, that's a good question. If you can't reach it, um, it will stop transmitting after five minutes because it's not getting the heartbeat. But how do you know? I'm not sure uh, how you're going to talk to that. Um, it will show there is a there is a concept of um, a CBRS message log that's uh, available in the GUI of the radio as well as on Maestro. So you will be able to see any given status provided you can communicate with that that uh, device. So it'll it'll give you the status of it. Um, but if it if the backhaul is down and you can't connect to it, I'm not sure how you'd see that. Um, in terms of it says, is Cambium developing a LTE CBRS product? And absolutely we are. Uh, we're launching CN Ranger. Uh, CN Ranger will be a third point to multi-point product line. Uh, I will have another webinar on that uh, shortly. I had one not too long ago. Uh, we're doing two, two gig first in that, that uh, product line. So CN Ranger will be launched in 2.5 gigahertz first. Uh, by the end of the year, we expect to have a Part 96 capable remote radio head and SM. Uh, meaning we'll have another option, an LTE option, uh, to use with CBRS as well. Uh, so yes, we are hard at work developing that product as well. And again, the advantage there is all about the range and the coverage. So if you if you have trees, if you have uh, if you can't make the connection with the 450 equipment because of obstacles and distance and uh, non line of sight, maybe Ranger would be a better option. However, if you can um, and you're doing it already with 450, then I would highly encourage you to stick with 450 because of the capacity, spectral efficiency, ease of use, uh, management system, all the different things that go along with that. Uh, tools, uh, there's a ask for what tools do you recommend for propagation studies or models? Uh, we have a tool, a free tool called Link Planner um, that's available to model our system. Um, we also have launched recently a, a product called CN Heat. Uh, CN Heat is a service that we provide uh, that you pay a small amount of money for and you can do a specific site and get a really good heat map of where you believe where we believe the uh, the uh, propagation will go. It's a much more accurate tool, very very cool stuff and it, it will support the 3 gig uh, 450 uh, if it doesn't already. Next question. Um, oh yeah, uh, I told you I'd give you some uh, contact information if you want to become ICD or, or try it out uh, as a beta. Um, first step, email me, uh, matt at cambiumnetworks.com and uh, we'll get you started from there. So that'll be the easiest way. Uh, just email me again, matt at cambiumnetworks.com and we'll, uh, we'll get you started on on beta or ICD if we can get into ICD. So ICD is a little bit tricky um, because it's an officially sanctioned uh, commercial deployment and so we have to work with the SAS uh, to get into that and they've already said that they're uh, kind of locked down for the first 30 days and then after that we can get in there with some changes. Um, so if you want to be part of that, great, we'll, we'll try to get you in but we're beholden to the, to the SAS provider. Uh, at the minimum, we should we, we can be able to start you with uh, beta testing this if you have an existing 450 network that you'd like to get uh, going to try uh, just to get familiar with how this is going to operate. So yeah, if uh, Garth's making a good point. So if your if your NN license does not expire April of 2020, if if you have one of those 10 or 12 percent of licenses that go beyond April of 2020, you can continue to operate under Part 90 until your license expires. Um, but that's that's really 
I, I did look through the database of FCC uh, NN licenses, and I 80% plus at least um, do expire on April of 2020. So that's the date most folks use because that's what affects most people. Uh, question, can the 450 product co-locate with CN Ranger LTE? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, we have a white paper uh, already published about how to co-locate 450 with any LTE. Uh, being as LTE is kind of a standard, if you can make the frame configuration and special subframe configuration the same um, or one of the selected options, uh, we can certainly make 450 uh, co-locate with it, meaning time, time well with it so it doesn't interfere on off-channel. Uh, that's a very important point. Um, people are running into that already uh, when they're using things like buy cells or Telrad. Uh, they can co-locate 450 and make it make it play nice uh, with those LTE equipment and so that, that we don't have interference, unneeded interference. And I think that's all the questions that I've gotten so far. Uh, I'll give you one more second, but I think I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you for attending. And again, if you have any further questions, I, we will be posting this in the forum, our uh, community forum. You can post questions there and have everybody have the answers. Uh, or if you're more comfortable, feel free to email me directly. Again, matt at cambiumnetworks.com. I'd be happy to answer questions for you. Um, and then if you want to be part of the, the beta, that would be uh, that would be fantastic. So again, thanks for attending. I appreciate your time. And uh, look for some more webinars in the near future. Thanks.